the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. An investigation update, don't look this Yiddish horse in the mouth, a blacklisted screenwriter remembers, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now on this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. A new investigation by the Jewish Channel has revealed a second questionable identity with connections to the scholarship of a leading rabbi and law professor. In an investigation published April 12th on the Jewish Channel's News Desk blog, TJC revealed that Rabbi Michael Broyd had created a fake rabbinic identity. That fake identity was used over the course of nearly 20 years to join a professional rabbinic group that rivaled Broyd's own to gain access to members-only communications. It was also used to author letters to scholarly journals that occasionally touted Broyd's work, among other things. Until that investigation was published, Broyd was considered perhaps the leading scholar among modern Orthodox rabbis. Broyd was serving as a rabbinic court judge on the largest rabbinical court in the country and had reportedly been on the shortlist to become chief rabbi of England. Broyd is now taking an indefinite leave of absence from the rabbinical court. Broyd is also a law professor at Emory University, where the law school was ranked 23rd in the country by U.S. News & World Report. This latest investigation is one that academic ethics experts told the Jewish Channel could have a greater impact on his academic career. The Jewish Channel's new investigation revolves around someone who claimed to be an 80-something Ivy League graduate and emigrate to Israel, who studied at one of the most exclusive yeshivas of the mid-20th century. But the Jewish Channel could find no proof that this man existed other than a letter sent from his email address to the peer-reviewed scholarly journal Tradition in 2010. The alleged man, going by the name David Ketter, was writing to support the arguments Broyd had made in a lengthy special supplement of that journal. The Ketter character claimed to have collected the oral history of some of the great sages of 20th century Orthodox Judaism and assembled them in a letter that supported Broyd's arguments 60 years later. In a follow-up article at another publication, Freud cited the evidence brought forward by Ketter as one of three, quote, additional sources that support my position which have come to light since my article came out. You can read the full investigation at the Jewish Channel's News Desk blog at newsdesk.tjctv.com. Of course, for some, taking on another persona is what they get paid to do. And for Broadway actor Danny Burstein, that's a new Jewish role, Meredith Gansman reports. Lanford Wilson's classic play, Tally's Folly, is the story of Matt Friedman and Sally Tally, who couldn't be from more opposite sides of the Ozarks. But one enchanted evening when this mismatched pair meet, they find romance after a lifetime of looking for love. But whatever time there is in a life is a lifetime. This is one of the opening lines of Tally's Folly, now playing off-Broadway, and at just 97 minutes long, with no intermission, the play's leading and only man, Matt, doesn't have a lot of time to win over the leading and similarly only lady, Sally. Tony-nominated actor Danny Burstein plays Matt. It's a, a wonderful story about how two people who in normal circumstances would never be in love, you know, because of where they live and where they come from and their different religions, and, uh, but they're absolutely perfect for each other. Matt is Jewish. He's had a very difficult background, having fled Europe before World War I after his parents and sister were murdered. Sally's upbringing couldn't be more different, but they both have a sadness that they've tried to bury in their past. Now each has to reveal it in order to be together. That we're both uh, eggs. We've got these very hard exteriors, but they're very soft, you know, beautiful center inside. We're just so afraid to crack our shells, but really, that's really what we want to do. We want to crack the veneers and just be honest and be open with each other. And, uh, you know, watching them come to a place where that can happen is a beautiful thing. Burstein said that playing Matt was one of the hardest roles he's ever tackled, but drawing from his own Jewish heritage helped him to shape the character. Uh, I found humor in, in everything uh, that went on in my house, and, uh, and I think that prepared me for this guy. We love jokes. Thank you, Meredith. If you're looking for theater that's filled with even more Jewish content, how about a Yiddish circus? Meredith Gansman also has that story. 
The Yiddish Theater is getting a circus makeover. I'm at the Megillah of Itzik Monger, and believe it or not, it's not my first time under the big top. Hey, big guy, how are we gonna mic you up? The National Yiddish Theater's folk spin up Purim Spiel musical, The Megillah of Itzik Monger, is being revived for the first time since its 1968 Broadway run. Evoking Mardi Gras, Carnival, and Commedia dell'arte, production designer Jenny Romain is giving famous Jewish stories and Yiddish culture a more modern sensibility. The culture experienced a disruption, mm -hmm. and it's like, what would have happened if we didn't experience the disruption? Mm -hmm. So what if the street performers and thespians of Poland could have just kept doing their job mm. and evolving. Clearly, they would have met under the big top. Tony-nominated actor Stephen Mohanan, who plays King Ahoshveros, says bringing the Yiddish circus to town adds color to the culture. The moment that Dorothy steps out of the house in The Wizard of Oz and then the world changes from black and white to color. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens when you go from Judaism to the circus. All of the color that was, that was there all the time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's just it was seen through a mask and then suddenly it disappears and it's like, oh wow, underneath that is all of this tremendous vitality. Andrew Keltz plays Faster Grossa, a love interest for Esther who you won't find in the traditional Purim story. I didn't have very many circus skills coming into it. I, I, do make, make balloon animals, which is something I did as a little kid, and we do utilize it in the show a little. For this non-Yiddish speaker, learning the language for the performance was in his blood. I know that language is not a genetic thing. This was the language my grandfather spoke when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, there's something about it that feels kind of natural. Stacy Harris plays Esther. She also juggles, but wasn't fully prepared to juggle a role in this unique Yiddish play. If you had asked me a year ago, was I going to be doing a Yiddish show completely in Yiddish, I would have thought... Oy vey. Yes, oy vey, exactly. Um, so it's been a great challenge, and now I feel like, oh, bring it on. Get, bring on the next one. For more from the Megillah of Itzik Monger, playing now through May 12th at the Baruch Performing Arts Center, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, keeping with our dramatic theme this week, Christian Neaton provides a profile of blacklisted Oscar-nominated screenwriter Walter Bernstein. Walter Bernstein has read plenty of movie scripts in his 93 years, and he's written his share as well. The Crown Heights, Brooklyn-raised Jewish screenwriter was nominated for an Oscar for writing the 1976 film The Front, starring Woody Allen as the face man for blacklisted screenwriters in the 1950s. That subject was close to Bernstein's heart because he spent a decade blacklisted from working openly on Hollywood films or television due to his own membership in the Communist Party. But with the help of friends, he salvaged a career that continues to this day, one that includes teaching work at NYU's Tisch School in the Department of Dramatic Writing, where he imparts lessons about cinematic script construction to a future generation of screenwriters. TJC sat down with Bernstein to talk about his career, which included Army service during World War II, writing for the Army's official magazine, Yank, and scoring the first wartime interview with Yugoslavian revolutionary Marshal Joseph Tito. I asked Bernstein if his military service had added insult to the injury of his blacklisting. No, not particularly. I, you know, I, uh, I wasn't blacklisted by accident. I'd been a, a lefty for a while, you know, and uh, uh, everything that I ever saw published about my activities was true, you know, and uh, so I think, you know, without trying to be high-minded about it, you, you believe in something, you pick up the tab for what happens afterward. What was surprising was that up till, up till then, a lot of us had the feeling that you could be rich and holy at the same time. Indeed, Bernstein had been openly communist since his college days, but still had his work published in magazines like The New Yorker, as well as a burgeoning career writing films. In the summer of 1947, he went out to Hollywood on a 10-week contract with Columbia Pictures to work for Jewish writer, director, producer Robert Rossin. But in November of that same year, the House Un-American Activities Committee subpoenaed 10 Hollywood writers to testify and expose communists in the film industry. They refused, and the Hollywood 10, six of whom were Jewish, 
were rewarded with their blacklisting from writing films, thanks to a secret agreement among the heads of every major Hollywood studio to not employ communists. Bernstein was swept up in a second wave of the Red Scare in 1950, when his name appeared in the Red Channels booklet, and he found himself blacklisted, an experience he chronicled in his 1996 book, Inside Out, a memoir of the blacklist. The writers were a lot luckier than the actors or the directors, because to work they had to show their face, and we didn't, you know. And uh, uh, I was lucky because I was able to make relationships with a producer and a director uh, who were went along with me writing under different names. So I worked for most of the time I was blacklisted. I didn't make much money, uh, but I was able to work, and, and uh, I made some, some very good, uh, profound uh, relationships with other blacklisted people. And uh, this may sound odd, but in some respects it, it was a not unhappy time because of that because the feeling of solidarity, the feeling of community we had, we helped each other. To hear more from Walter Bernstein about his eventful life and his career as a very useful screenwriter, please tune into the full broadcast edition of The Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. That's all for this week from all of us here at the Jewish Channel. Be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.